After graduation, the wealthy students of an elite private school decide to have a lunar eclipse party, despite the island-wide policy to leave at 6 p.m. Near a beautiful tropical island, a small fishing boat floats above the gentle waves. Cram stands on the ocean floor, holding a harpoon gun. Suddenly, he hears a deep rumble from beneath the earth, compelling him to swim back to the surface. Later, Cram rides his motorcycle to the private school for the graduation ceremony. The other students enjoy their last day, taking pictures and celebrating with friends. When Cram takes something from his locker, Anan bumps into him. He apologizes and tells Cram that if he ever visits the island, he'll eat at the restaurant where the islander works. With a quiet voice, Cram tells him that he'll be studying in Bangkok, which Anan assumes is a scholarship. Then, the beautiful May passes by, and Anan catches up to his girlfriend. Suddenly, Joey pats the islander on the shoulder, comforting his close friend. Joey advises him not to mind Anan since after graduation, everyone will be on their own. Then, he invites Cram to a lunar eclipse party. He had asked his father to pull some strings to forego the 6pm student curfew. However, the islander declines the invitation because he has work after school. Yet, Joey insists that he swing by after shift since the party will go on until dawn, to which Cram reluctantly agrees. Later, with the party in full swing, the intoxicated seniors celebrate and dance under the night sky. Elsewhere, Cram has just finished his shift and spends quality time with his stepdad in the car. As the two talk about the lad's nearing departure for college, the topic shifts when Cram receives a box containing an ancient dagger owned by his birth father. The gift confuses the teen since he thought his stepdad never met his birth father. His reaction tells his stepdad that Cram hasn't listened to his voicemail yet, a message that contains the truth about Cram's birth parents. Suddenly, the lights on the street start to flicker, and the moon in the sky turns red. As the students at the party notice the moon, they begin to point at it with excitement and awe while taking pictures. Meanwhile, Cram gets out of the car to stare at the moon, when he notices the colossal ocean wave building up from afar. His panicking stepdad calls for him to return inside the vehicle and tries to start the engine. Unfortunately, the destructive wave lands on them before they can escape. Cram groans in pain as he looks over and sees his stepdad passed out on the steering wheel, bleeding from his forehead. The lad tries to wake the unconscious man as the water enters their car. Suddenly, a boat hits the windshield, cracking the glass. Cram screams in fear as the water fills the vehicle. He helplessly tries to break the cracked window for them to escape. But as the car fills with water, Cram can only watch as his stepdad perishes. His lungs slowly run out of air and he loses consciousness. 25 days later, Cram somehow managed to survive the disaster. The wreckage swept ashore by the tsunami are scattered all over the beach. Later, Cram speaks with a classmate about their challenging situation. The scared student fears the possibility of not being rescued since they haven't received any news from the mainland for nearly a month. Then, he asks Cram how he survived the tsunami, but the islander doesn't remember. Elsewhere, a female student, Arisa, is flipping through her classmates' cell phones, checking which ones still have enough battery to use to check for a signal. She uses Nat's phone, but still doesn't pick up any reception. Joey and Anan arrive, and she tells them that they need to tell the others that the plan with the phone is useless. However, Anan insists that the mainland might still be repairing cell towers from the tsunami. With a sigh, Joey agrees that Anan's plan is failing, and Arisa adds that the others never appreciated their phones getting confiscated. Anan presses that they had agreed to his plan, and returning their phones will only further dwindle their chances at getting rescued. Joey reminds him that if they were still people on the mainland, they would have been rescued by now. At the school clinic, May checks Jack's temperature and injury. She notes his fever and infected leg wound. May worries for Jack's well-being, especially with their lack of medicines and medical knowledge. Jack's boyfriend, Crit, also worries about his condition as May tells Jack that he needs to stay in the clinic for observation. Jan enters, carrying a tray of food for her sick brother. Later, May approaches Joey for help, telling him that Jack's leg seems infected, and asks if he knows where to get antibiotics. Joey mentions that Cram might know, since he's a resident of the island. Afterward, the stranded students gather in the cafeteria for their unappetizing food rations. While looking around, Anand makes a speech about his group's search for phone signal. However, no one seems interested in listening. His announcement is interrupted by the two class clowns, Nat and Gunn, who present an old mechanical device they found, thinking it might be a retro video game. Arisa examines the antique device and recognizes it as a vintage tape player. Nat wonders if they can use it to listen to music. However, Ice points out that they wouldn't need the tape player to listen to music if Anan hadn't snatched their phones anyway. Everybody starts to rally for Anan to return their phones, calling him arrogant. 
To calm the crowd, Joey steps in and empathizes with the student body, asking for another five days of patience, which the others agree to. Later, Joey and Cram make their way to the village chief's house for possible supplies. Joey spots Cram's dagger and compliments the blade. At school, Arisha excitedly opens the tape player, hoping to fix it. Suddenly, Nat and Gunn come barging in with an old tape they found. After Arisa insults their unpleasant breath, Nat retorts that her nasty remarks are the reason why everyone hates her. Though visibly hurt by the comment, Arisa pretends she doesn't care, as the two boys walk out. Sighing, Arisa recalls seeing a female student lying on the bloody floor, while she stands over the body with scissors in her hand. In the village chief's house, Cram and Joey find medicines, including the antibiotic May wanted for Jack's infection. While looking around, Joey excitedly calls Cram to look at something outside the window. Cram and Joey find a boat stuck atop a cliff. Joey believes the boat may be their last hope of reaching the mainland because their futile search for a signal has been unsuccessful. He decides to climb up the rock face despite the islander's warning. Halfway through the climb, Joey slips and falls several feet down. Cram tries to catch him, but he's too late. Minutes later, Cram brings his best friend to the clinic and lays him down on a bed. May lifts up her shirt and she panics upon seeing his bruised skin over a visibly broken rib. Shaken, she takes a stethoscope to examine his injured chest. Just as she fears, she's unable to hear Joey's left lung, indicating a severe injury. She steps back in panic, telling Cram that she doesn't know what to do. Cram asks the others to leave the room, so May feels less pressure. Then, the woman grabs a medical book and quickly flips through the pages for any information regarding a rib injury. She thinks Joey's lung has collapsed, and she must insert a needle into his lung cavity to release the air pressure. As the woman takes a large syringe, she positions herself beside him. However, due to her lack of knowledge and experience, May can't perform the procedure. She falls to the ground crying, trying to muster up the courage to save her friend. Suddenly, Joey holds May's hand and tells her it's okay. Seconds later, Joey perishes, much to Cram and May's sorrowful guilt. In the observatory, Cram confronts Anan about his decision to keep the others in the dark regarding the unsuccessful search for a phone signal. The islander tells Anan that there's a boat they can use. However, Anan refuses to acknowledge his idea. Later that day, the classmates gather by the beach for Joey's funeral. As his body burns, Anan makes a speech about the boat that he claims to have found, stealing Cram's idea. Speechless by his shamelessness, Cram holds his tongue as he stares at Anan. That night, the students get their phones back and tearfully scroll through the photos and videos of their family and loved ones. Meanwhile, Cram sits alone near the shore and finally listens to his stepdad's voicemail. However, his battery dies just before he hears the important part of the message. Suddenly, the ground shakes and a loud ringing fills the air, making Cram curl up in pain and his eyes turn white. When Cram opens his eyes, he finds himself in the middle of a forest, where he sees a woman carrying a baby. As he follows the woman, vines wrap around his ankles and throat, pulling and strangling him. Nam sees his body by the beach and tries to wake him up. Cram opens his eyes with a gasp, breathing heavily. The peculiar and spiritual woman asks what happened to him. Cram says he was having a dream, so Nam asks him to describe it, but the man refuses to elaborate. As the lad is about to leave, Nam calls out to him and hands him his dagger. Later, Nam arrives at the school and sees her classmates clamoring about the latest earthquake. She explains that it's connected to a phenomenon humans can't understand. However, the others mockingly laugh at her, thinking her reasoning is nonsensical. After Nam leaves, Anand speaks about escaping the island via boat. Then, Ice rudely interrupts by taunting him, eliciting chuckles from the crowd. Feeling oppressed, Anand remembers when he was still a musical conductor. While Anand tries to perform his best, one of the violinists doesn't listen to him, disrespecting his authority. After the rehearsal, his father berates him for his lack of control over his orchestra, comparing his own skills to his son. In the present, Ice and Ying are exploring the rest of the island. Ice shows his girlfriend his secret spot, a beautiful lagoon. Sensing her boyfriend's distress about their situation, Ying distracts him by inviting him to get intimate and jumping into the water. Ying traces her finger on Ice's chest before kissing the spot over his pacemaker. While the lovers make out, the water's temperature rises until it starts to boil, scalding them as they hurriedly leave the lagoon. They run away in panic, calling for Anan, who's busy organizing the others at the beach. The couple shows their classmates the boiling lagoon, which adds to the urgency of leaving the island. The first objective on their agenda is bringing the boat down from the rocky cliff. The boys wonder if the small boat can carry them all to the mainland. Cram tells them that only 10 people can fit, making the others reluctant to work on fixing it, when they might not even be one of the passengers. 
to defuse the situation, Cram tells them to decide on the first 10 people later and suggests using a pulley to bring the boat down, which Anan approves. He orders the others to bring a rope, three logs, and a pulley. The next day, everyone's gathered all the materials and equipment for the task. However, Anand's lack of knowledge makes him incapable of instructing the others. Kram suggests making a tripod at the top of the cliff and using it as a lever. Then he starts climbing the steep cliff with the rope. Ice joins him, despite Anand discouraging him from the strenuous task due to his weak heart. His comment aggravates Ice, who's even more determined to climb up with a pulley. Anan remembers his concert performance as a conductor, comparing his rude violinist to Ice, who arrogantly makes it up the cliff. Suddenly, Ice accidentally drops the pulley, hitting Kram's back. Anan is reminded of how his leadership as a conductor failed, disappointing his father with his weakness. Later, Kram is sent to the clinic, where May treats his injury by cutting his flesh open and draining the blood. Sensing his trust in her mediocre skills, May feels a closeness with Kram as the two share their secret ambitions with each other. Kram's dream of being an underwater photographer and May's aspirations as a singer. Meanwhile, Arisa and Ying fix the antique tape player and power it up with a bike generator. With enough power, they use the old tape that Nat and Gunn found to test the device. As the music plays, a woman's voice ominously sings about how life will end and utters the word Prachisuria. Intrigued, the two ladies barge into Nat and Gunn's room while the men are changing their clothes. Arisa apologizes as she skims over the bookshelves and asks them where they found the tape. The boys tell her they found it in Professor Lin's room. Then, she finally finds a book containing the poem with the unique words in it and leaves with Ying. The ladies discover that the poem is about a kingdom full of imperfections and a great flood erasing it from existence. Upon hearing Arisa's interpretation of the poem, Ying fears her own realization of how the poem eerily mirrors the reality. That morning, everyone manages to bring the boat down from the cliff and successfully transport it to the shore for repairs. Meanwhile, Arisa and Ying realize that the tape has been intentionally manipulated because the lines are jumbled around when compared to the original poem, making them ponder on the tape owner's decision. At the shore, everyone discusses how they'll choose the first 10 people to leave the island. May nominates Jack because he desperately needs medical attention, and everyone agrees. The discussion comes to a halt when their dinner is served, frustrating Anan. He remembers his mother asking him to play the piano for her before leaving for school, and he regrets not doing so. Anan feels the yearning for his mother after seeing the abandoned piano on the beach. He plays a classical song that captures his classmates' attention. Amid the performance, Nam asks Kram about his dream and advises that if he ever dreams again, he mustn't resist and see where it takes him. When Anand's performance ends, everyone applauds and Nat requests a pop song, which the pianist obliges. As the music plays out, everyone joins in singing, lifting everyone's mood. Suddenly, a mysterious woman walks out of the forest and collapses to the ground. Kram hurriedly runs to her side to see if she's alright. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.